Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, director at the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University and the project on Middle East political science. Uh, welcome back to the POMEPS Conversations. With me today is Michael Willis of the Middle East Center at St. Anthony's College of Oxford University and the author of a new book with Columbia University Press, Politics and Power in the Maghreb, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco from Independence to the Arab Spring. Now, uh, this is a fantastic book, and it brings uh, attention to North Africa, which is often missing from, uh, from at least the way Arab politics are studied in, uh, in the United States. And I want to talk about uh, the, the Maghreb as a whole, but I actually want to start someplace else. Uh, I, I really loved your first the, the first book of yours that I read, which was... My first book, yeah. Okay, your first <laughs> book on, uh, on Algeria and the feasts. And I want to go back to that a little bit and see... If you, what do you see as similar or different from what was happening in like 1988 to 1992 with the rise of the feasts and this transition to democracy there compared to what we're seeing now in various parts of the Arab world? I think that's really quite interesting because if you, if you, if you look at uh, what is happening, and a lot of Algerians are saying, well, the world is looking at Algeria and saying, well, what happened in the Arab Spring? Where did it, uh, why did it not affect what's going on in Algeria. And Algerians say, well, we've been through this. We've been here before. Um, mass riots that uh, don't have any clear political leadership, leading to a period of political reform and a, a rise of a mass Islamist movement. We did this in 88, 89, 1991. Now, as we know, the experience was not a happy one. It ended up in uh, a near victory for the Islamist party and then uh, an effective palace coup by leaders of, uh, of, the, of the old regime uh, particularly with um, elements of the military, but crushed it and then led to a nearly a decade of extraordinary bloodshed. So we're hoping this doesn't repeat itself elsewhere. But Algeria feel that they have had some experience. Their experience perhaps is a precursor. Uh, we had George Joffe speak at Oxford a couple of weeks ago who looked at the idea of Algeria being a precur precursor. That said, I think things are very rather different. Again, the whole region has moved in a different sort of way. Um, and I think most interestingly, and I've been talking to particularly Islamists in both Morocco and Tunisia, and they are acutely aware of the Algerian example. And they, they right. consistently say, this is not something we want to follow, and we're learning from that particular example. But, you know, what have they learned? Uh, what, what, uh, you know, how do we avoid repeating that Algerian experience, which was, which was so horrible? I think, well, for example, if you look at Rashid Ghanoushi, who's the head of the Nahda movement, the main Islamist movement in Tunisia, uh, he has said that the mistake that, that the feast made, and he said that they themselves earlier on made as a party, was to try to go too fast too, too soon and not to try and establish uh, a, a broader institutional and constitutional framework which would protect and bring everybody in and also didn't try and reach out to other political parties and actors to form a broader base and to sort of normalize relations with the rest of the political framework in each of the countries. So that was one of the main lessons that a lot of them have learnt, that you work through the system, you don't try and achieve everything overnight, certainly from the Islamist point of view. Right. Now, one of the things which I always found fascinating about the feast was that it essentially had both the Muslim Brotherhood style uh, movements and the Salafi type movements organized into a single political bloc. I, I can't really think of any examples comparable um, either in North Africa or elsewhere. Uh, and what you have now is much more competition between Muslim Brotherhood type movements and Salafi type movements. How does that change the, the dynamics of this kind of uh, political involvement? Yes, well, I think the example of the feast was interesting, but it was really, it was put together so quickly from such a, a wide range of groups, and it only really lasted three years. And I think the tensions were enormous within it, and we saw them break out in the 1990s. And I think in some respects you're seeing some of those tensions that we saw in the feast play out today in a lot of countries where you get this division between the Brotherhood trend and the Salafist trend. And I think that's a very interesting dynamic and something that people aren't paying too much attention is the relationship between the two. It's, it's very easy, a lot of the enemies of the Islamists, the political enemies of the Islamists, write this off and say, well, it's two sides of the same coin. I don't think that's the case at all. And I think the dynamic and the argument over it is going to be very interesting between, we see in Egypt, in Tunisia, and to a certain extent in Morocco, this emerging as well. Now, now, now your, the, your new book looks at Algeria along with Tunisia and Morocco, and the choice of those three, mm -hmm. do you think that there actually is enough, there, a commonality there to group them together as a distinctive set of countries that uh, are different from the rest of the region? Yes, I saw that there was enough in common and enough different to make it an interesting comparison. 
The um, geographically, ob they obviously uh, um, uh, join one another. The experience of French colonialism was a common factor, which had a huge mark on all three. Uh, that's one of the reasons I don't cover Libya, partly because of Libya, it was under Italian colonial rule, and also the rather strange rule that took it after 1969, after Muammar Gaddafi took over, made it a really rather different sort of country. I think there's certain patterns. I look in the book, and one of the puzzles I set out in the book to explain was to say why there had been remarkable continuity in the political regimes in free countries. Of course, we saw that in 2011, that, that pattern began to break open, which I think <laughs> makes it even more interesting. But I think there are certain common right. patterns, particularly how the regimes that were put in place after independence, after the departure of the French, were able to um, um, retain themselves in place uh, th you know, four, five decades right. later, later, effectively the same uh, structurally, the same regimes. Well, you had that big rupture in Algeria, though, yes. in 91. Uh, in, uh, and uh, in, is it really fair to call that the same regime after it reconstituted itself? I think it is, effectively, in terms of not the same personnel, but in terms of the same structure. What you have is you have a civilian face to what is a military-dominated regime. Uh, you have a civilian president um, or, uh, who is then, by a rather shadow regime, made up of the senior military officers from the military and from the intelligence service who make the key decisions. Uh, you do have a more pluralized, you have a more sort of facade pluralistic situation with, with political parties, with elections and etc. Um, but in many ways it looks very, very similar to what before. What it has is added this sort of multi-party party veneer, but if it's the same structure in my view. The, now, most people, what they remember is the political domination followed by this palace coup and the bloody civil war. What about the experience of feast local governance? You talked about that quite a bit uh, in, in your books, about when they were actually elected and running those, uh, those localities. How did they, how did they do? They didn't. And, and what lessons might there be yes, for a kind it, of now Islamists in government? It's very difficult to say. There's been very little study of that quite important experience. Um, at the time, it, was, it attracted a lot of tension inside Algeria, and it was very controversial. One of the problems of dealing with this is a lot of the enemies of the, the political enemies of the, of the party were keen to pick up on anything going wrong. But a lot of experience on the streets seemed to be that actually ran it uh, in a way that actually responded to local local concerns, which was so, a so, big departure from what So what about before. like on Ahda in Tunisia yes. now? Do you see this playing out in the same way, or are there differences in the way people are responding to Islamist governance? I think, again, it's still, we're still trying to play it out. And of course, you've got government at the national level dominated by NAFTA. We haven't had a local elections yet in Tunisia. We won't have them until after the next set of legislative elections. And there is a lot of discussion in, in Morocco and Algeria, for example, that local government and local elections matter more than we think. People don't tend to look at that. They tend to look at the national level. Mm -hmm. But the local level is mattering more and more. And the feeling that we're now in a democratic arrangement, or at least an arrangement where parties have to pay attention to what the ordinary people in the states think, um, that could have some impact. And the whole idea, and this is what is very interesting now, is we have Islamist parties in, 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 in yeah. power in Egypt and Tunisia and to a certain extent in Morocco, and the feeling that they have to deliver. And, and have to interact with the And they're really the grappling population. with that for the first time. Absolutely. Which, which is why I found the experience of the yes. feasts in local government yes. so interesting, because it was one of the few examples we yeah. had in the past of Islamists actually being yes. forced to govern. And but by my, what I remember from your book was that uh, they actually did a pretty good job with services, yes. but there was some variation in yes. how much they tried to impose. Yes gender segregation, yes. closing swimming yes. pools, that sort of thing. Yes, and they inherited a hideously difficult legacy from the old ruling party. There hadn't even any big com competition, and there was a fair amount of sabotaging and debts and things like that. But that said, there was a feeling that people thought that they were actually had people who were running them who actually were concerned about what was happening locally, which was a complete break from the past. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if this will actually begin to happen now, or whether you'll find that the perception of ordinary people, of the Islamists who have now assumed government, but they will become much more like the regime, rather detached from the concerns of ordinary people and just concerned with power at the national level. And you see, you see this in Egypt as well. Let's talk about Morocco briefly. Um, and uh, you know, so you had the emergence of a fairly sophisticated and interesting protest mm -hmm. movement. King comes out with these constitutional amendments. How how is that playing out now? Are those meaningful political changes or? Uh, is this simply back to business as usual? I think that's the big debate in Morocco, whether it's seen as a, a change or not. Um, 
it was a very, very, a very, very smart and swift move by the king that completely cut the ground underneath the protest movement. He moved very swiftly. He became identified with the reform movement. He almost took it over. Why do you think that he was so quick when almost every other Arab leader lagged behind the curve? I think, first of all, they were able to watch what happened elsewhere. And also there already was a more openness to reform and change. And Moroc the Moroccan regime has tended to adapt and move and change to avoid the sort of problem seen elsewhere. They've in many been, ways, they've been more flexible. Absolutely. And Morocco looks a little bit at Algeria as well. But I think with the debate, it seems to me now, that's happening in the Royal Palace is they feel there's some of the advisors, some of the people within the Royal Palace think that actually it's business as usual. We need to forget about it. We survived the Arab Spring, continue. There are others who think that actually this isn't over yet. And I think the, well, the second opinion is the more valid one because the Arab Spring, even so like Morocco, seem to have awakened, and I think this is true across the region. Ordinary people are not willing to accept the sort of things and the sort of problems and the sort of misrule they accepted before. If you look at the number of strikes, if you look at the number of protests, uh, it's a changed atmosphere it's, in Morocco. It's still happening, you Absolutely. Think. And then just let's end quickly then, going back to Algeria. Everybody wants to know, you know, why not Algeria? Why has Algeria managed to avoid? So I might as well ask the, yeah. the traditional question, you know, why has Algeria managed to avoid it thus far? Well, there's sort of, I think there, there's several reasons. First of all, you've got to bear in mind it has huge oil and gas resources. So they just turned on the tap to try and damp things down. There'd been a lot of local unrest that had sort of released a pressure valve uh, of unhappiness um, in the regime. So it hadn't been the build up of pressure. You've also got a, a regime that doesn't have a singular uh, uh, focused on one main head of state. You've got a much more, Algeria is quite unusual in the Arab world in having a rather collective leadership. So who, who do the public unite against? Is it President Bouteflika? Is it the senior military figures? Is it the head of intelligence services? You haven't got that sort of focus. So there's no unifying There's no unifying thing for, 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 for the public to go against. But I think those are all secondary reasons. The main reason, I think, is the experience of the 1990s. That still weighs street, pro way. street protests, the extreme violence, etc. There's a that has made Algerians hesitate and be very cautious before going down that particular road again. There's never been a real accounting for or accountability for the slaughters and for the massacres. No, and what seems to have happened in Algeria is there's been a sort of a, 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 a sort of more or less tacit agreement amongst all the sides that they, they don't discuss that yet. And in fact, it's it's the the large parts of the of the is, is, um, armed groups allied to the FIS. Um, they there was an amnesty. They came in, mm -hmm. and there were there was a, more or less a deal done with the public and with the Bouteflika that the generals and the senior military figures, for their rather sh shady involvement in the in the mass in the massacres and in the violence, it, it is is not going to be discussed. It's actually been criminalised to actually discuss and suggest that military are involved. So it's almost like it, it was the, the, the joke in Algeria. There, there there hasn't been an amnesty. There's been amnesia. The joke <laughs> works better in French than in English, but no, you can see good. where it works. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. I'm Michael Willis uh, from Oxford University, author of the new book, Politics and Power in the Maghreb. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me.